so much for joining us here for another bird talk with Chirp Nature Center. As you can see from these photos, we have been, we are in our second year of holding these events. And now that they're virtual, you can enjoy them at Chirp or from the comfort of your own home. So just keep in mind, our next top talk is all about bats and that's on Saturday, September 19th at four o'clock. But today we are here to learn about fantastic flying squirrels. So I have a few birdhouse rules before we begin. We are gonna have a special guest speaking about our animals today and feel free to post questions in the chat throughout the presentation or you can wait till the question and answer session at the very end. Either way, we'll try to get around your questions. And if not, you can always call us or email us at Chirp Nature Center for the answers. So go ahead and enjoy these next 45 minutes, but make sure that you pay attention because at the very end of the presentation, you will have a chance to take a short quiz that will allow you to be entered in to win a free, fantastic, squirrely prize. So get ready for that. But for now, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna introduce you to our flying squirrel specialist for today. His name is Bob Cisneros. And from childhood, Bob has had a connection with nature. He studied psychology and zoology in Hawaii. And he worked in marine biology for six years. In 1993, he was hired as a San Diego Zoo hospital keeper and became the area's supervisor of the children's zoo, and then eventually ended up managing one fourth of the San Diego Zoo altogether, which is awesome. He then became the director and curator for the Big Bear Alpine Zoo and dedicated five years to making connections between the animals and the public from an educational perspective. In his free time, he was also the president of the American Association of Zookeepers for four years and has been involved in multiple international conservation projects for animals such as polar bears, tree kangaroos, rhinos, and the list continues. Today, he is joining us from Utah's Hogle Zoo, where he's the associate director of animal care. So thank you so much for being with us today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see your lovely face, Bob. And can you talk about your first aha moment when you knew that you wanted to work with animals as a career? I was, uh, I, hi. <laughs> I was in the first grade um, and, and we were living in Virginia and we went to the um, Smithsonian's Natural History Museum. And when I walked in there with my classroom, there in front of me was a, um, a, an African bull elephant. And it turns out it's the largest elephant in, on record. And I was so impressed with it. And mind you, I, I was in the first grade and I I just had an, an aha moment. And I think that could be spelled A-W-E mm -hmm. as in awe. Um, I really was, I was in awe of this elephant. I walked around, I looked at it. I just couldn't believe that there was something so big and so real. And um, while I did that, the rest of my class walked away and did their tour of the museum. And um, I, I was pretty much left to do the museum on my own, my first great experience. But it it, um, it really left a resonance in, in my heart and in my brain. And I, and I knew that there was gonna be a connection to follow um, in the years as I got older. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. So I was curious about this. Since you've been working with so many animals, what is your favorite animal? Normally, what I would say is my favorite animal is whatever species I'm working with. And um, <clears throat> and it's very easy to say that it's the flying squirrels or it's mountain lions or black bears or cougars or um, grizzly bears. Um, I, I would probably probably say if I had to pick two, um, one would be the pangolin, the white-bellied tree pangolin, also known as the scaly anteater. Um, and then the other, of course, would be elephants. Um, I have never worked elephants before in my whole career. Um, I've had opportunities to uh, work with elephants, but I have never been responsible for the, the care and husbandry of elephants. But I have with pangolins. And um, so they really turned into one of my most favorite um, species ever. Wow, that's awesome. Another question for you. What has been your experience working with flying squirrels, which is the animal we're talking about today? Well, it's interesting. I um, When I was at San Diego Zoo, um, I worked with a keeper named Scotty. And, um, you know, back in the day, we were doing whatever we could do to just, you know, to get 
to get our hours, to get our, our place in the department. And so we had this camaraderie going. Years later, when I, when I uh, um, over 20 years later, when I moved up to Big Bear, I got an email from Scotty. And um, Scotty was a, um, a mammologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And so he writes me and he says, I hear you're the director um, at Big Bear. Um, at the Alpine Zoo there, and um, funny, I'm going to be up there pretty soon. We're doing a, um, a a research project on the flying squirrel, which at that time was called the San Bernardino Flying Squirrel, and um, we've looked all over the uh, San Jacinto Mountains and have found no trace, and we're really curious about what the numbers are um, in Big Bear. Let's partner, and, and so that's that's how it started. It started with a very simple handshake. Um, and then when Fish and Wildlife got involved, they asked if we could ever um, get our hands on some flying squirrels, if we could use them as education animals and ambassadors in order to really drive home the need to preserve our forests and maintain the balance of the ecosystem. And so we um, we acquired some flying squirrels. They're, um, their nest was destroyed and they came in as babies and they quickly um, uh, became um, adapted to human presence so we couldn't send them back into the wild and they became ambassadors. Their names are Truffles, Lichen, and Juniper. And they are found still at the Big Bear Alpine Zoo. Um, often the keepers will do presentations and they'll do the presentations with the flying squirrels. Wow. Um, so that's my background with them. That's awesome. Well, I hope we get to learn more throughout your presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm so excited. Does that mean I get to share my screen? Please do. Please share your All screen. All right. Let's see if this works. Oh, oh, perfect. It's working. All right. Take okay. it away, Bob. All right. So we're going to talk about the Humboldt's flying squirrels. They also were known as the northern flying squirrel also known as the San Bernardino Flying Squirrel. Now, those bottom two lines um, had a, uh, a different scientific name. And so if you know about scientific names, you know there's a whole process that um, is involved in the, in the nomenclature. And so it used to be that um, there were two species of flying squirrels in the United States, the Northern Flying Squirrel, the Southern Flying Squirrel, and, um, and then subspecies. And so we had the Southern California or the San Bernardino subspecies. So what we had was Glaucomus sabrinus, which is the northern flying squirrel, Californicus. And so, yep. And then about three years ago, um, a grad student did some work and realized that there were actually some major differences between the subspecies and the, the, the regular northern uh, flying squirrel, and and the the, the differences were um, were so great that it qualified it to have become its own genus and species, and so it became Glaucomus, same genus, but the species then became Oregonensis, um, and so the common name that he named it after Humboldt the explorer, and so it became Humboldt's flying squirrel. Um, so that's the story behind the name change. Common names are not always a good thing because a common name simply will tell you somebody's description of something, doesn't necessarily tell you anything more about it. Um, I, first of all, I do want to thank Chirp. Um, there's no mask on this, but that's because we're alone here, so there's no need for a mask. But I, wanna, I, I want to thank Chirp, and I, I, I love you guys because um, you really make an effort to connect people to wildlife. We're, we're brethren in that sense. We share the same mission. And um, I've been to your store several times and um, I just, I, I love what you do. And, and it, from everything from your walks to, to these lecture series, to the, the screens that you have up in your store, I think it's important for people to have um, the ability to just see how amazing and um, unique a lot of the species are here in, in um, Southern California as well as here in um, Utah. Here in Utah we have magpies and they're really amazing corvids. So um, 
if any of you guys have ever been out in those areas, it's um, uh, pretty amazing to see just how smart they are. Um, but I digress. So um, I also want to thank the Big Bear Alpine Zoo. If you haven't been to the zoo in Big Bear and you guys are coming up, it's, um, it's one of the best kept secrets uh, in Bear Valley. Um, it's two and a half acres right now. Um, with about 125, 130 native species and some alpine species. Um, and based on current information, it looks like they'll be moving into their new facility shortly. I can't tell you when opening date is. You'll have to call the zoo to find out. But if you really, really want to get connected to wildlife and, and really have a good understanding of the, the value of our ecosystem, the zoo has some really, really um, powerful keepers that have a great sense of messaging. So I want to thank the zoo for that and also thank my zoo um, for um, for all the amazing things that we do out here as well as the local conservation efforts that we make and for the opportunity to um, present to you guys here. Um, Utah's Hogle Zoo is located in Salt Lake City and um, we have over 800 animals in a 42 acre facility um, as well as um, we're also an AZA accredited zoo. So if you're ever in Salt Lake City, come say hi. Um, you'll, you'll recognize me, except I'll have a mask on. So, um, But anyway, so let's get down to brass tacks. We're going to talk about the, um, uh, the flying squirrels. You'll see the map here. And if you look down and if you can see down below, you can see the key for colors. Glaucomus sabrinus, northern flying squirrel. Glaucomus volans, which is the southern flying squirrel, and then Glaucomus organensis. Let's see if my cursor works here. Does my cursor work? Yeah. Can you see that? Okay. So this is the range for the northern flying squirrel. This is the range for the southern flying squirrel, including, isn't this amazing, Mexico, which tells you something if you know your geography. The terrain in here is definitely not the terrain here. So there's a lot of special specialized adaptation. Um, this is more tropics. Um, this is more arid uh, and temperate. Um, what's interesting is you have these little islets of occupation, and then you have shared space where they have found both northern and southern uh, flying squirrels. And there was a uh, an acoustic expert that did some trials at at our zoo at the zoo in Big Bear who determined that if with a trained ear, um, you could tell the difference between a northern and a southern flying squirrel. She said that the southern flying squirrels um, spoke a little slower. I don't know if that was the draw, um, but, um, but she did say there was a market, marketable difference. And, um, and then moving over here, you can see parts of the green. <clears throat> this is the uh, range of the Humboldt's flying squirrel. And so you can see most of the Pacific Northwest. And then if you look down here even further, so you, you can see California, San Diego's down here, LA, Orange County. And then we have San Jacinto and Big Bear. Um, and you can see how isolated these areas are. And that's a really um, important thing to talk about because isolation is not a good thing. Um, typically what it means is that if there's, I mean, we've had some pretty decent fires in Southern California. And so all it takes is a devastating forest fire um, and you can wipe out a whole species um, just by doing that. So fortunately, the um, subspecies was not unique to the region. If we go back, you can see that the subspecies is actually its own genus and species and that it's found throughout the Pacific Northwest. But again, all it takes is something like um, you know, some of the fires that we've had in the past, and you can wipe out all of the species in, um, in the Big Bear area. How am I doing so far? I think you're doing great. And for okay. everyone who's joining us, I would encourage you to kind of warm up your chat hands and just, I want to know, have you guys ever seen a flying squirrel wherever you're joining us from? So you can post that in the chat as we continue the conversation. All right, take it away, Bob. Okay, great. Um, you know, they should have a um, like a yes, no paddle or um, oh, I can see Mark says that he's uh, never seen one. Yeah. Um, can you see that? Yeah, I can. Well, thanks for playing, Mark. And 
Bob's going to show you many on his presentation. So let's keep going. So um, conservation partnerships, and, and we talked about this a little earlier, um, the Big Bear Alpine Zoo is partnered with the San Diego Natural History, History Museum, California Fish and Wildlife, and then also the Department of Forestry um, to highlight and um, also to study the uniqueness of this rare species that, uh, that's found in our region. Um, and one of the things that, that, that the uh, San Diego Natural History Museum has done is they've created a citizen science program. Now they're interested in knowing where are the flying squirrels? How can you, where are they with respect to um, development? And, um, and, and how does um, being in a habitated environment affect um, their populations? So it's interesting. So what they do is they set up a citizen science program. If you have flying squirrels in your yard or you've sighted them, then you can go uh, and get in touch with the Natural History Museum. They will uh, come up and give you a camera trap. And, um, and then with that camera trap, they and also some bait, um, they'll set up the camera trap. And then you upload the photos. They confirm that they're flying squirrels. And then they come back and set up DNA traps. And the DNA traps are nothing more than just little fur collectors. So it's like having... Um, duct tape um, boxes. So what they're doing is they're collecting fur because they want to make sure that whatever um, flying squirrel they see um, at summit is not the same flying squirrel they see in Moonridge. And so they want to they want to have some sort of unique identifier. And then what they do with all that, that information is they map it. Well, what they found was pretty interestingly enough, they, they um, threw out Lake Arrowhead, um, Oh, what's the um, what's the small little lake? Um, Baldwin Lake? Nope. Uh, Green Valley. Oh, there you go. So Green Valley has a lot of flying squirrels. Oh. Um, uh, Angeles Oaks has flying squirrels. Parts of Sugarloaf has flying squirrels. Fawnskin has a, a whole lot of flying squirrels, and so does Moonridge. And so they they started mapping all this stuff out, and they found flying squirrels in all of these regions, and um, they. They also wanted to know um, deep into the forest, how are they going to find this information out? Because they don't have, um, they don't have anybody um, living out there who can say, I saw a flying squirrel last week come out here and bring a camera trap. But they found this graduate student who was studying the spotted owl. Mm -hmm. And the spotted owl is the major predator for flying squirrels. And in his studies, he had collected all of these castings. So, um, so uh, raptors don't digest their, their prey well. Um, and so what they will do is they've got fur and bones, right? So they, once they've finished digesting everything, they, they compact the fur and bones into this little cast and then they cough it up. And so yeah. this grad student had collected all of these little castings and then labeled them by geographic region. <clears throat> and so what Scotty and his team did was they got permission to go in and dissect those castings. And they were able to map more places in the deep forest where the uh, spotted squirrels or where the um, flying squirrels were. And then what they found out was it, it really didn't matter whether it was deep forest or whether it was in uh, the Moon Ridge neighborhood. It didn't matter. The population was uh, the same in either place. And I thought that was really interesting because typically whenever man meets animal, animals usually will retreat because we don't coexist very well. Part of uh, the reason why that might be possible is because we have bird feeders and the bird feeders generally um, are um, attractants and also because they're nocturnal. Did I already say that they're nocturnal? No. Can you okay. explain well, what What's that? Can you explain what nocturnal is or means? Sure. So <laughs> I just happen to have in my next slide, Perfect. animal activity cycles. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, um, so animals have activity cycles. Um, there are animals that are um, diurnal. So that means a diurnal animal is awake during the daytime, which most of us are. And then we have nocturnal animals 
nocturnal animals are animals that are um, active during the night and they have special adaptations that allow them to be able to um, uh, to be able to survive and function at night and then we have crepuscular which is one of my favorite words crepuscular animals that are most active during twilight um, in, in both early dawn and early evening and so uh, a lot of crepuscular animals are not quite nocturnal and don't have the the um, the adaptations. Um, they may choose to be crepuscular because it's less energy um, extended in order to hunt or to avoid predation uh, instead of at mid at, in midday where when it's 110 degrees. So a lot of times you'll see that kind of. Um, um, don't I, I um you'll find a lot of animals will make those decisions um based on that kind of of um can i give you an example of a crepuscular animal Ooh, good one raccoons nocturnal crepuscular lions would be crepuscular um wolves might be considered crepuscular um lions will sleep during the day Lions will sleep 20 hours, let's put it that way. And they'll hunt a lot of times, they'll hunt in the early mornings. A lot of big cats are crepuscular. Um, Fusa, although Fusa are more, um, they're basically everywhere. They're just, um, they're, their behavior patterns are just bonkers. But most of the time they're crepuscular. Does that help? Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay. So, as I said, diurnal refers to animals who are active during the day and sleep during the night. Crepuscular refers to animals who are active during early dawn and late evening. And then extended activities may include daytime and nighttime cycles. Nocturnal refers to animals who are active during the night and sleep during the day. I had a roommate like that um, once. So night activity re re reduces the risk of predation. Um, nocturnal animals have highly developed senses of hearing, sight, and smell, which are specially adapted to make the most out of night illumination. And the lack of light helps animals hide from predators, but also gives nocturnal predators the ability to hunt while well hidden in the dark. And, and, and you'll know, you know that in the dark, there is no color. So color is based on available light. How many times have you um, purchased something at the store and then when you brought it home, it's not the exact color that you thought it might be because the lighting is different. Or um, my, my wife wears makeup and she likes to have a bathroom where the lights are true. And, and she says because the shades will tell you what the colors look like. So colors are based on light absorbency. And so you'll see um, col true colors based on, um, on true light. When you turn the lights out, um, a bright orange windbreaker ceases to be bright orange. And so you can sometimes tell a nocturnal animal based on its color. For instance, a raccoon is nocturnal and it doesn't need color. So that's why it's black, gray, and white. Skunks, gray foxes. Um, so a lot of animals that um, that are either crepuscular or nocturnal are don't have any color because they don't need to hide, right? Those those colors that they need to blend in are um, are not necessarily for their um, survival or success. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so interesting. I did not know that. So how do nocturnal animals see at night? They have big eyes. And if you have, um, if you are a camera buff and you've got a lens, you know that the aperture of your lens allows more light to come in. So if you're shooting in the dark, that, that aperture has to open up and allow more, more light in, and then it has to stay open for a long time, right? Because it wants light to come in. So if you look at nocturnal animals, you'll see they have huge eyes. And the reason why is that it, it allows them to be able to process and pull in whatever little amount of ambient light is there. 
So at night, more than likely, they they see shades of, of gray or possibly like having NVGs. Do you know what that stands for? I do not know what that stands for. Night vision goggles. Oh. You see the SWAT team on TV come in and they flip their little goggles. Oh, yeah. Those are NVGs, night vision goggles. Um, and then just, you know, one of the things, I, I, I do want to talk about the owl, even though this is um, – couple of months premature um you can call this a um a teaser um the owl is by the way as i said earlier the um the main predator for flying squirrels and i want to tell you why what makes the owl successful as a um as a predator at night number one he's got those big 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 eyes big dark eyes that means he's he's nocturnal they have amazing eyesight. And if you look at that head turning, they don't have the ability to, to, to um, scan with their eyes the way that we do. And that's because they're, um, that's because they're, um, their eyes are so big that they need to have bones in order to hold on to it. So um, it's a, um, so they can't turn their eyes scan their eyes to the right, to the left, so they have to turn their head to do it. Now, the owl has other adaptations um, that we'll talk about, but one of the things that, that you just saw was the um, ability for um, the owl to have silent flight. And so they have ruffled feathers, they have um, fringes on their feathers that allows for air to pass through, and it basically takes the sound out of its flight. So that stealth factor is um, <clears throat> is one of the things that makes it um, uh, successful. The other thing that it has is its field of vision with its broad eyes. And then they're able to rotate their heads a full 270 degrees. And this rotation compensates for their ocular immobility. Now, this is the interesting part. They have um, a... Um, a heightened sense of hearing. By the way, um, owls do not have a heightened sense of smell. Uh -huh. uh, actually, I suppose you could say they do um, because anything times zero is still zero. And if you have <laughs> heightened zero, it's still zero, I guess, if you looked at it from a mathematical perspective. But they have no sense of smell, which means they don't have problems eating skunks. So if anyone ever asks you what's a major predator of skunks, it's an owl. Well, what they have is asymmetric hearing. And that asymmetric hearing means that they have, they have an, a, 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 an orifice here and they have one down here. And what that allows them to do is to triangulate noise once they hear it. So they can look straight ahead, not move, and, and hear something like a leaf crumble or something else, hear that, and then from there, know where that, that animal is, and then look over, see it with their eyes, and then fly in in stealth fashion and um, be able to capture their prey. So, um, so stealth wings uh, and an amazing sense of uh, hearing and those amazing eyes. That's what makes the owl successful. And again, the reason why I'm telling you this is because the owl is a major predator for the flying squirrels. And it will help me um, develop um, an argument for why the flying squirrel is so highly specialized. Uh -huh. um, so what senses do nocturnal animals rely on? Well, since the air is still at night and scents linger longer in the air, it becomes easier um, for nocturnal animals to pick up and track scents, unless you're an owl, of course. Um, also to communicate a, by sense of smell as well as find food. So what makes the flying squirrel so important? They're, they're seed dispensers. And I, I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, they're, they're sloppy eaters. <laughs> and so what happens is they, they will eat and drop, eat and drop, eat and drop, eat and drop. They're also, they feed off of lichen, um, uh, pine nuts, um, they will also eat uh, truffles, and we do have truffles in Big Bear and the Bear Valley. And so what happens is while they're shaking the truffle, they're also dispersing spores. 
So they're spore dispersers. So they're important to maintain the balance of the ecosystem and the uh, forest environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Glaucomus organensis, the Humboldt's flying squirrel, is a long-whiskered nocturnal mammal of the forested areas in North America. And it's found only in the conifer mountain regions of California and the Pacific Northwest. Conifer being pine trees. And, um, and that's why we have them up in, um, in Bear Valley, mostly by um, Snow Summit, by uh, Moon Ridge, uh, Fonskin, all of those areas that are um, thickly populated with pines. Um, they thrive in forests with big trees and closed canopy cover, large snags. Do you guys know what a snag is? Um, snags are those um, are, are hollowed out trees. Oh, okay. um, that are dead. So that's called a snag. Um, and then um, uh, nestling canopy cavities, downed logs, um, which foster the growth of truffles, um, and uh, understory cover that provides perfect protection from predators. How am I doing so far? Yeah, you're doing great. There's okay. a question. I did have a question for you. I wanted to ask real quick. Um, Super Mummy on YouTube asked, they're so cute. Um, how long do they glide for? Maybe this is a question you're going to answer later. So I don't know, but that was... Um, uh, given, given the right circumstances, they can glide for 100 yards. That's a football field. Oh my gosh, right. Well, there you go. No. So there's the answer. Okay, keep going. This is so interesting. Pretty am amazing. So um, despite its somewhat misleading common name, the Humboldt's flying squirrel does not fly. Um, it glides by extending a fold of skin that stretches from wrists to the ankles using a flattened tail as a rudder. This is a great picture. This is called a patagium, and that is the flat tail. So um, it's the only squirrel species that is nocturnal and spends a majority of its life in a tree. Wow. Uh, the fur of the species is brown on the upper parts, facing uh, fading to a buffy white on the belly. We call that ventral counter shading. Um, <clears throat> they might be a, a more appropriately called gliding squirrels because they aren't capable of true powered flight that a bird or a bat can do. Flying squirrels glide. Um, they have special membrane between their front and back legs that allows them to glide through the air um, between trees. And um, they have a lot of different specialized adaptations. Um, one of the adaptations that flying squirrels have is the, the ability to communicate in a, um, in a, in a very uh, low frequency um, that actually owls cannot hear. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to play. We, we had a graduate student um, come to Big Bear and do some recordings. And so what he used was a subsonic recorder. So, it, so these are inaudible to the human ear. But you guys are going to hear them. And let's see if I can do this. Um, let me go back. Um, here we go. So the reason why the uh, subsonic um, <clears throat> volume is so important for the flying squirrel is because it allows them to communicate with each other without causing that owl to be alarmed. Remember that owl has the uh, asymmetric hearing. So at the minute it hears a noise, those ears pinpoint the location of where that noise is coming from without ever having to turn their head. So if you have if you have the ability to communicate in a in a volume that cannot be detected by the owl, 
that makes it right. That gives you one more advantage to being able to communicate. Um, not a lot is known about this form of communication. It's also um, thought that the um, subsonic communication um, is a form of echolocation, which allows them to um, use the noise in order to read their environment. And that might be important, um, especially if they're gliding from tree to tree, um, and it might give them information when that um, echolocation comes back. Um, but nobody has really, um, nobody's really come up with that information yet. So, um, but I do want to tell you, um, and if you look at the um, at both of the pictures in the right and the left hand corner, flying squirrels make great escape artists. Uh -huh. um, Thanks to their great gliding capabilities, um, they're able to land on a tree. But when they take off, the minute that they think something is chasing them or following, they can use that tail as a rudder and they can bank 90 degrees in, um, in a, um, a split second. And an owl can't do that. So <clears throat> it's kind of a top gun fight with a, um, with a sh sharp little um, fighter plane that can do um, tight bank, tight, tight turns. Um, so that's one of the things that, that allows them to get away when they're being chased by a predator. I wanted to um, show you this. This was actually taken in Moonridge um, and um, they, they are incredibly fast. Uh, if you will, once I start playing this, you'll see this um, pine here moving. I think this was on somebody's garage cam. Oops, sorry, my friends. Let's go back. And you'll just have to wait for it. And if you want to see it, there it goes. Oops. Do you want me to play it again? Yeah, we should probably play it again. Wait for it. That's the flying squirrel. And it's crazy because it's um, so fast. Yeah. And it's almost like it's, it's, it's going so fast. The eyes, you can see the eyes, but uh, it almost looks like they're in back. It's going so fast. They're really, really, truly fast. Um. <clears throat> We have more unique adaptations. The patagium, like I told you, is really important. Um, it allows them to get the lift that they need. Um, you can see here the large eyes. And here's the flat tail. It's just some really good photos of these guys yeah. in their flight. Really and there's really not a whole lot to that to the body cavity. Um, they're very small. They, they weigh about 125 grams. And um, so there's not a whole lot. Um, there's not really a whole lot to them. Oh, my gosh. Flying squirrels and base jumpers. Uh, humans have long been envious of the flying squirrels gliding abilities. Base jumpers and skydivers develop the special suit uh, that mimics the flying squirrel. We call this biomimicry, by the way. Wow. The suit works to slow their descent and allows them to um, maneuver through the air. And so, when you look at the at the um, at the base jumpers um, suit here, and you look at the patagium on the flying squirrel, you can see where they were able to get that inspiration. Some people call biomimicry bio inspiration, but um, call it what you may. Um, <clears throat> it still means that. Man looks to nature um, in order to um, be able to, to get ideas on how we can make improvements in our life, whether it's through um, recreation or whether it's through um, how we live. Um, there are a number of um, instances with flying squirrels where they um, come into human contact and it doesn't work out well. Um, the the two flying squirrel, two sets of flying squirrels that we received at Big Bear um, a few years back. Um, one came because they, um, the, the mom had built a nest in a, um, a cell tower. You know, we have the cell towers that look like pine trees. Yeah. <laughs> There's one over by um, 
by Moon Ridge Cafe and and um, and Dank Donuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Flying Squirrel built a nest. And when the uh, technician went up there to service it, he opened up the box. The nest fell, and um, the mom ran off. And so he brought the babies in. And then another one was a tree trimmer, and um, he had um, cut down a snag and and um, found the flying squirrels inside and so we brought it over to the zoo and we were able to hand raise them and while you transition to the next slide I just want to let you know we have a little mm-hmm. under 10 minutes before i'd love to get some of those questions answered for the q a session okay so this is awesome thank you so much and just show you a couple of we're and we're pretty close to um finishing out here um but it, you can see that they they are um, they're like Velcro. Um, when they when they leap from one tree to the next, um, that's pretty amazing. <clears throat> um, and there there's a lot of interest in them because they um, they definitely are are unique. I mean, there I'm sure there are a lot of people in, in the audience who have never who never knew we had flying squirrels before, and um, so. Um, oh, and I do want to talk a little bit about Joel Sartori and the photo arc, and there there is a segue here. Um, Joel Sartori um, has a, a a number of books, um, some of which are found at Chirp. Um, so if you're at Chirp, you can uh, buy Joel Sartori's um, photo arc book. Um, he's a National Geographic photographer. Uh, he's been all over the world trying to capture uh, nature in some of its most unique moments. Um, He came down to Big Bear Alpine Zoo um, a couple of years ago. Um, Joel and I um, met in 2014, and we had been corresponding back and forth. Um, And when I moved to Big Bear and we had the flying squirrels, I contacted him and said, you should really come out. I don't think you have flying squirrels um, in your... um, in your arc and of course we didn't have the subspecies and he was really interested and we just couldn't make it work out yeah. and um mm-hmm. so finally he came out and um we were able to get our schedules um together and um so i had him come out to big bear alpine zoo <clears throat> we went into the um, flying squirrel exhibit and um and then what he does is he takes he has um something similar to a white tent and um, he places the animal in the tent and uh, and then he uses his camera to take pictures um, and he also uses a black tent. <clears throat> so this is one of our flying squirrels featured by Joel Sartori. See those eyes? See how big they are? Huge. He's so cute. And, um, and, and again, it, um, it, it really puts us on the map. When Joel came down to, to Big Bear Alpine Zoo, um, he really was interested in um, in the flying squirrels was his first reason. And he ended up adding six other species from the zoo, our yeah. kit fox, um, our acorn woodpecker, our raven, our crow. Um, what else did we have? Um, Stellar's. And I think that was it. I might have missed one or two, but um, all in all, seven species. So it was really a, a, a good moment for us. All right, I'll open it up. Any questions? The time, okay. So there have actually been a lot of questions coming in from different people. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, that way we can okay. see again your wonderful face. Um, let's see, I'm gonna look through the chat. So we have a question from Catherine Peterson. She said, when you have to hand raise them, how successful are the releases back into the wild? Really difficult one because they're just um, they're they are uh, they have a tendency to bond, um, and I there there is a a um, a rehabber out in um, in Lake Arrowhead. I don't know if she's still doing rehab out there, um, <clears throat> but. Um, she had a lot of successes with um, releasing and she gets 
she gets more than, I mean, these were the only guys that we saw in the five years that I was at Big Bear. Um, so we were fortunate that, um, that we did, you know, get a chance to, to raise these. Um, but um, I think her name is Darlene. Um, when I see her, when I would see her reports every year, um, she would have about a 90% um, release rate. So I think that's pretty stellar. Yeah, that's really good, right? Um, all right, another question for you. Laura asks, yeah. do, oh. different, do different species of owls have more or less space between their ears? Um, are, are you asking if their brains are bigger? Well, Laura, you'll have to confirm that. More space between their ears. Um, Maybe in relationship to where, like... The, you mentioned how their hearing is asymmetric. So is oh, there the, the, a, the asymmetry? Is there a difference in their asymmetry? I bet there is by species. Um, just like if you if you look at owls, not all owls have those black eyes, like the the um, the one owl that we saw um, in the film clip. A lot of owls will have orange, um, so, and some will have uh, bright red or yellow. So, Eve, so there are a lot of physical characteristics that are different um, among the species. Okay, well, thank you for the answer. Another question being, why in one of the pictures you had, did the flying squirrel have a pine cone? Do they eat the pine cone? They love pine nuts. Oh. So it's not the pine cone, it's what's buried inside. It's the pine nuts that they really like. That makes sense. All that right, another question for you. <laughs> There was a publication, oh, this is from Shelly. She says there was a publication in the last year or so about being confirmed as glowing pink under black light. Oh, yeah, isn't that funny? Is that? Yeah, I read that. Why they're first fluorescent? Every, so um, part of it may be their ability to see. And, um, and so there's not a whole lot of information out about that, just merely that small amount of evidence so it's pretty bizarre when you think about you know we um for for us in our field uh, our our role is essentially to be an educator and um a person who connects the dots and so you know it, they make our jobs really easy because they have all of this cool and bitching stuff that that um i said bitching didn't i sorry um, so. Yeah, I, I get I get teased about it because it makes me they, they say it's like it's retro or something. I, um, <laughs> but but anyway, we have all these animals that have all these amazing ways that they can smell things from a phlegmin response, which is the ability to use an ex, some uh, some very sensitive glands at the roof of the mouth where a um, where a um, a gazelle can smell, a male gazelle can tell if a female gazelle is cycling. Um, wow. And so, you know, we have all of these heightened senses that enable us to succeed. Nature is really perfect. And, and um, so with, <laughs> with, um, with so many different species, we have the opportunities to really talk about how amazing they are, how unique they are, and what a loss we would be at without them. Seriously, it would be a tremendous loss. Um, but honestly, I don't know why that coloration uh, is present, except it will have to do with somebody else's ability to see um, or blend in. Wow, that's Next so... One. Okay, more questions are coming in left and right. Lily asks... When is the nesting season and what does that involve? Um, so what they do is they like to fall, they like to find a hollow um, and um, and generally nesting will be uh, sometime in, in um, early, early spring um, and they'll find a hollowed out log um, and that's, or a snag and, um, and they'll just, um, they'll fill it up with uh, twigs and straw and grass and anything else that they can find. Awesome. All right, another question for you. Dragon Warrior asks, what is the average amount of babies they have per year? 
Um, it can be anywhere from, oh, per, per year, it could be anywhere from two to four, possibly six. Interesting. Good one. Um, Mark asks, is, I hope I pronounce this correctly, genus? Glaucomus. Yes, thank you. Big eyes. That's, yeah, that's what they asked. Is it due to their big eyes? And you answered that. Well, well done, Mark, for asking that question. I think we have more coming in. Okay, another question from Catherine. Are there flying squirrels on San Jacinto Mountain? Oh, really good question, because there's a good story. Um, two were cited um, around the turn of the um, 19th to 20th century. So somewhere around like 1900s. Um, and so um, my buddy um, from the San Diego Natural History Museum, Scotty, um, Scotty Tremore, he and his group went down and they, they searched everywhere for... Um, for the the flying squirrel and um, excuse me for one second <clears throat> they searched everywhere for the flying squirrel and they couldn't find it and so that that caused them to go to big bear because they knew there were flying squirrels in big bear and what they wanted to do was determine what is the, what was the difference between the terrain in um, big bear and san jacinto and why did this species become extinct in that region and it, will th would that be the same fate for um, the flying squirrels found in um, Bear Mountain? That is really interesting. So for all of you out there, we have a few minutes left of Q&A, so keep those questions rolling. We have one from Lorraine. She says, flying squirrels are nocturnal, but would you ever be able to catch one at dusk or early dawn? You might. Um, and in fact, um, my guess is a, as a crepuscular behavior, you'd probably be more likely to see them in, in the um, uh, late dawn period. Um, I, I talked to a lot of folks out at Green Valley um, and they used to talk about setting out their lawn chairs in their backyard and um, so they could watch the flying squirrels go by. So, um, which I thought was kind of cool. We actually have flying squirrels out here. We have the northern um, out, out in um, out just by Logan, so not too far from so Salt Lake City. So I, I'm really excited about talking to um, the Department of Natural Resources, which is our the equivalent of California Fish and Wildlife or Fish and Game, um, and finding out more. I'd love to have them out here in our zoo. Um, next question. There was a question. There's kind of two. There was one asked at the beginning that says. Are they endangered here in SoCal? And to piggyback off of that, is there anything we can do such as habitat restoration to encourage them to move into the area? Well, um, so for the first question, are they endangered? You, you have to have numbers in order to um, be able to support um, endangered status. And so that's what, um, that's what, what Scotty and his crew were trying to achieve was find out what are the numbers of this species. And so <clears throat> um, it's everything is still in legislation and still um, the, the numbers are still being counted because if you remember, they were simply a subspecies and um, it, without much um, importance or value. But now that they are a separate species, then it means that, um, that 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 might carry a little bit more clout in terms of their um, their IUCN status. And then the second question was: Is there anything that we any kind of habitat restoration that might um, cause them to come closer? Encourage them to move Encourage in. Them. I think a lot of it would have to be um, first of all, if you have Jeffrey pines in your in your uh, neighborhood, that would be good. Um, here's a big one. If you have cats or dogs, do not leave them outside all day long. Oh. Um, cats are responsible for um, for the loss of millions of birds um, per year. They um, so, and I'm not just talking about feral cats. I'm talking about the cats that we let um, um, that we let run around. Same with dogs. Um, so it's an important message to, you know, let people know that if you keep your animals inside, um, the nature will be allowed to thrive outside your house. 
that didn't answer the question, um, <clears throat> but it was a really good narrative. Um, <laughs> the um, so if you if you live in an area where you have a population of flying squirrels, and you you can um, set up um, bird you can set up the suet feeders with the peanut butter. They really absolutely love peanut butter. By the way, so do black bears. Um, oh. Yeah, so you're going to always have some competition there. Um, and where you find one, you typically find the other. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what to tell you, except um, you can always set up bird feeders, but I, I think you'll always run into an issue with black bears. Hmm. Oh, that is good to know both sides of that. We have two other quick questions and then we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. We have, um, this is from Kat. Do any other species have spiny tails besides the Lord Derby? Besides the what, what? Is the Lord Derby. I don't, um, maybe see if you can find, um, if you're able to repost that question cat, we will totally get to it. In the meantime, if you could answer this one real fast, Stephanie asked, I've seen the Eagle's nest videos here in big brown fog skin oh, and yes. usually flying squirrel in the nest. Oh, are they on the Eagle's diet as well? <clears throat> they could be, um, bald Eagles really love fish. Um, they're excellent fishermen. Um, but, um, they, um, you know, if you go to the, if you go to um, the zoo in, in Big Bear, the bald eagle and most of the raptors will get rats. Um, so rodents are um, are a um, a prey item, but um, my my guess is they're um, they're quick and smart, and um, so they that's probably how they survive. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for joining us here today. I've learned so much, and I assure you from all the questions and comments coming in, all of our attendees have really enjoyed this presentation. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Yeah. All right. Well, as we close out, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and our last few details because now it is your turn to win your, win your special prize for joining us here today. So let me get that set up real quick. All right, here we are. So thank you all for joining us here today. And now it is your turn to take the Bird Talk quiz and claim your prize. So it's super easy to access this quiz. It's maybe two minutes long, but you're going to go to chirperbirds.com, which is our website, and just backslash type in quiz. That's your link. Super simple, super easy. Okay, so here's the exciting part. Our prize for today by taking this quiz, you will be entered into a drawing for this free squirrel-only feeder. Now, the nice thing about this feeder is it's made from 100% recycled plastic, so it's very durable against all harsh outdoor weather, and it has a really cool hinge lid and a plastic um, front so that you're able to see the food inside and only squirrels are able to access it because they learn how to get to the treats by lifting up the little hinge lid. So it's just kind of a fun way to wash all the squirrels in your backyard. Yard. And regardless, as a thank you for not only joining this presentation but taking this quiz, you will be receiving a participation prize. Now our little sticker is the chirp sign. So every time you see it, you can think of us here in the <coughs> area. And don't forget, you only have 24 hours to complete this quiz. So make sure right after the presentation is done, you go straight to chirperbirds.com slash quiz and get ready to claim your prize. Now, until we get to see you again, I want to remind you of some of the upcoming virtual events that we have. The next event that we have is our how-to series. Now, this is on the fourth Wednesday of every month. And the reason that we started this series is because so many of our customers ask questions about backyard birding, like how to get started. So we just had our first how-to series video, which you can watch on YouTube or on Facebook. And this upcoming one, which is on August 26th, this is all about finding that perfect feeder. And now that you've learned that flying squirrels also will use and have access to bird feeders, go ahead and learn about how to get that feeder, not only for your backyard birds, but also for those flying squirrels. We also have our virtual bird walks. Now those are on the second Wednesday of every month. We have two, less, two left in our current birding season. 
and be on the lookout for those. You can also win a lot of fun prizes. And as you're joining us here today, we do have our virtual bird talk. Now the next one, as mentioned, was all about bats. So get ready to get batty for bats on September 19th. Okay, here we go. Until we see you again, let us know how we can help. We are located in the Big Bear Lake Village Center, but you can always call us or email us. We have both our number and our email below. And in order to keep updated on all of our virtual events and upcoming activities, you should follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are Chirp for Birds, and we hope to see you very soon. So until then, thank you for joining us here today. Now go ahead and test your bird brain or flying squirrel brain at chirpforbirds.com backslash quiz, and we cannot wait to see you very soon.